is Surge Education. Surgical education for parents. We are here to inform, inspire, connect, and heal. Surge Education, Episode 7, Bedwetting. Dr. Hans Paul, Chief of Urology, Children's National Hospital. Welcome to Surge Education, to another episode of our uh, uh, podcast. My name is Michael Petrosian. I'm your host. Today, I've privileged having Dr. Hans Paul. He's a chief of urology at Children's National Hospital. Uh, as you know, this podcast is created for those uh, parents or anybody in the world who wants to learn about pediatric surgery, everything pediatric surgery, which entails many subspecialties. One of them is urology, which is pretty important. And uh, talking to Dr. Paul, we decided to do a podcast on bedwetting, which is pretty common and concerning uh, uh, question or issue for many parents. Welcome to Surgery Education, Dr. Paul. Thank you for being here. Thank you. It's a privilege and honor to be here, Michael. I hope this is not the last time. Oh, no, definitely not the last time. Yeah. Well, I have some questions prepared for you. Hopefully, we'll be able to teach many parents, including myself, about childhood bedwetting problems. How common are childhood wedding problems? Uh, well, well, as you know, um, being a parent yourself, is every kid basically uh, grows up in diapers until they're about two years old. And uh, so every child technically wets the bed. Uh, what happens is that uh, when kids are about uh, three to four years old uh, and have uh, completed their uh, daytime urinary control, they then develop nighttime control also. And so there's actually a fairly uh, set pattern of how kids develop control of uh, daytime uh, poop and urine um, control and then uh, nighttime poop and urine control. And uh, the last uh, function that we learn how to manage is actually nighttime uh, control of our urine. Uh, so uh, it has been estimated that about uh, 15 to 20 percent of kids who are about five years old uh, are still wetting the bed and the number then starts to go down from there with uh, each passing year there are more and more kids who become dry are all childhood wetting problems the same in kids well we um, in terms of bed wetting um, we we discuss it in terms of kids who never became dry. So these are the kids who uh, manage to become dry in the daytime and have uh, urinary control in the daytime, but never were able to get out of diapers at night. Um, and that's compared to kids who were perfectly um, potty trained, if you will, for nighttime control. And then they actually develop bedwetting. There are two distinct populations. Two distinct populations. And this, of course, um, is very different also from daytime uh, urinary control issues. And there are some kids who have uh, daytime control issues who do not have any nighttime control issues. So they're dry at night, but they wet during the day. And then there are kids who actually have uh, control issues during the day and during the night. And so um, we have to untangle all of the symptoms when parents bring their kids in saying, my kid wets. So when should uh, concerned parents address this issue? Is there a certain time or when do they th uh, need to worry about when their child starts bedwetting? Uh, we generally don't want to see kids until they're about seven years old because there is still kind of a range between five and seven, uh, which uh, some kids are still wetting the bed and it's relatively normal or acceptable. Safe to say when a child is five to seven, is relatively okay. It's, it's relatively not okay. Alarming. It's not alarming, right? So, so certainly, some of their friends are probably dry at night, but it's still not alarming if if your car, kid is wetting the bed uh, at that age. But then, after the age of seven, uh, if they're still wetting the bed, then that's about the earliest that we would uh, want to do anything about it. Um, and it's also dependent upon whether it's a problem for the kid. So, a lot of the treatments that we we give. Uh, recommendations for uh, rely on the kid also being interested in becoming dry. So some kids are not particularly bothered by uh, the wetting at night, and um, so they become much more difficult to treat. How often do these children with wetting issues also have constipation and bowel control problems? And this has been really hotly kind of debated as to uh, whether these kids are constipated or not constipated, and uh, the data are somewhat unclear about that because uh, 
we don't really have the best tools to diagnose constipation uh, in kids. Um, as you know, there have been a variety of, of groups um, uh, out of uh, Rome that have tried to define what is constipation in kids. Uh, and uh, people have tried using x-rays and they've tried using ultrasounds and we really don't know. What we do know is that um, as many as one out of five kids who wet the bed at night, uh, if you treat them for constipation, the bedwetting actually can improve. So it suggests that there is a certain Some amount of yeah relationship between, uh, between that, but not in all kids. So there are other kids who actually have bedwetting for a variety of other problems. So for instance, some of the kids, they may have parents who wet the bed. And so you actually stand a reasonable chance of wetting the bed yourself if one of your parents uh, wet the bed. Um, if both parents wet the bed, then you have about a 70 to 80% chance of becoming a bedwetter yourself. So it really does you know, matter. So how do you treat bedwetting problems? Is there a medications you have to give? Is there certain behavioral changes that kids have to do? So how, so how we attack it is you, f you first have to really get the, the symptoms, the voiding symptoms. So the, as I s said before, kids either are just wetting the bed and in the daytime they have normal urine control and normal bowel movements, or there are kids with sort of a mixed pattern. So they have daytime symptoms as well as nighttime symptoms. So what we first need to do is we re really need to go and get a good history. Um, I tell all of our trainees and all of our pediatric nurses that 90% of understanding uh, urinary control issues really depend on getting a really good history uh, from the parents. Um, and, and so that really relies on uh, oftentimes having the parents uh, take a, a survey or a questionnaire home uh, and maybe even record what the child's symptoms are during two or three weekend days when the parent is able to really observe what the child is doing kind of, as I like to say, in their natural habitat. Um, and, uh, and then with that, you can figure out whether it's a, a, a daytime plus nighttime problem or nighttime problem only. But for the purposes of making it simple, let's just assume that it's just a common nighttime bedwetter. So there are really only two treatments. One is a bedwetting alarm and the other is medication. And the bedwetting alarm works very well. It has the uh, longest um, success rate. So if you, once the kid gets dry using the bedwetting alarm, uh, they generally stay dry and they don't relapse. And how is the bedwetting alarm works? So it's interesting. Um, we don't exactly know why kids wet the bed. Um, there probably is some a difference in the way that they sense bladder filling. And so when uh, they have a full bladder, the bladder should wake us up and send us to the bathroom even if it's in the middle of the night. But these kids don't. They don't wake up and they sleep completely through uh, the, the event. Um, and so what the alarm does is it senses when the child begins to urinate and it makes a very loud sound. And the so idea... It stops the wet. It doesn't stop. Uh, oftentimes, they, they may actually continue to, to urinate. Yeah. But what it does is it's supposed to then wake the brain up, teach the I brain see. to wake up in association with that uh, level of, of sort of stimulation from the bladder. Um, what's also unfortunate is that it's extremely loud. Uh, and generally wakes the entire rest of the house up. In fact, in the beginning, it probably wakes everybody else in the house up except, and the, except child. the child, right. And so that becomes extremely frustrating, uh, particularly for houses where, you know, there are other kids in the house and everybody is waking up and wondering why, you know, Timmy's alarm is waking everybody up. And it's loud. Um, I, <laughs> I once, uh, I, I correlated actually the, the loudness of the sound to common sounds in our environment and the the decibel level of the bedwetting alarm is the same as a jackhammer wow yeah that's pretty loud that's pretty loud so uh in terms of the medication uh you can use the medication it does work very well in many kids but it's a way of sort of fooling the body into thinking that uh the bladder is empty you know, i mean it, it basically what it does is it slows down urine production at night and so if the bladder doesn't get full then there's less opportunity for it to release 
And so when you come off the medication, since you haven't trained the body to do what's supposed to happen, then when you come off the medication, right, then, then what happens? So there is no quick fix. You're saying the best way is the bed alarm. Better way is the bed wetting alarm, which is the non-quick fix. Correct. The medication can actually be a very quick fix. So we can actually get kids dry uh, within three to four weeks of starting the medication. So there, there's an advantage, for instance, when kids are wanting to go off to summer camps or you know Boy Scout sleepovers or just to sleep over to their friend's house, of knowing that you have a tool to get the kid reliably dry that night. So it definitely works in those circumstances. Um, but it's not necessarily a cure. So you have to then be... It's a quick fix. It's a quick versus fix. Versus of a long term. Right. So I look at the bedwetting alarm as a cure. I look at the medication as management. I see. So can bed alarms and medications completely cure the child from uh, bedwetting? Yeah, so both can. So one way to look at the medication as a, as a form of management is that if you, if you acknowledge that every kid eventually becomes dry, well, almost every kid, because there's about uh, up to 3% of the adult population has some bedwetting problems. Uh, but if you acknowledge that, that basically 97% of us become dry at some point during childhood, then you could certainly uh, use the medication as a way to manage the wetting issue until the child is going to naturally outgrow the bedwetting. And at that point, you could stop the medication. Okay, so what about those kids who were doing fine and they had some so sort of psychological stress and now they started uh, bedwetting? Um, do you, how do you treat those kids? Uh, do you just remove the, that psychological stress or any stressors in their life and that uh, bedwetting problem miraculously goes away? Or is it treated the same? Well, uh, yes. Um, if the underlying problem is the psychological stressor, then you have to manage the psychological stress. And, and so the secondary nocturnal enuresis or the secondary bedwetting, the bedwetting that basically comes later in life is bedwetting that is a response to something bad that's happened right. in the child life. So perhaps bullying or a death in a family member or separation, divorce, uh, or, um, being part of the foster care system. These are the kind of things that we typically uh, see. Um, very, very rarely though, there are act what we would call organic causes, so a real sort of medical reason for it to happen. And, and so rarely we do pick up some neurological problems, uh, spinal cord issues uh, in some of, of the kids that start wetting the bed at night. So uh, you can't just um, dismiss uh, it as, oh, the kid is stressed out and let's give him some time. Um, it does make sense to see a pediatric urologist to make sure that there is no underlying medical reason for the, for the bedwetting. Okay. So what would be your take home message to parents whose kids have bedwetting issues? So the first uh, thing no that worry, I would take, cause that's what parents worry. As you know, you worry about everything, right? No. Yeah, no. It's yeah. As a normal. parent. Yeah. So as a parent, uh, no, I know you worry about every single thing, every, you know, pin that drops in the Even night. And you think you know the, the answer. To <laughs> the right, exactly. Um, the first thing that I would say is that this is a very common problem and, um, and it is not a problem that is really in the child's, um, under the child's power to, uh, to treat. Okay. Um, no child wants to wet the bed. Uh, and uh, there, depending on the age of the child, there's probably also some embarrassment and shame that surrounds the fact that they are still wetting the bed and they know that their siblings or that their friends are not wetting the bed. So I think that that's the first thing to, to keep in mind. Uh, the second thing to keep in mind is that it is a problem that, as I said, is going to go away. Um, Luckily, we do have methods to help it go away faster than perhaps uh, it naturally would. Uh, and the third thing I would say is uh, that um, getting angry and frustrated about it is certainly not going to help uh, because um, I'm sure that everybody is frustrated about it and uh, cooler heads definitely will prevail in the end. Thank you very much for being here. I'm hoping this is not uh, this won't be the last time that you're uh, invited as a as a speaker. We appreciate and having you here and teaching parents about bedwetting. 
Um, if you have any questions, you can go to childrensnational.org, Department of Urology. Dr. Paul and the team can be found there. There is, uh, He has a large team of urologists working with many urological issues, and hopefully they will be able to help you if your child has any urological problems. Otherwise, see you next time on our next episode of Surgication. Thank you.